Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious on this episode. You know, our wonderful nonprofit has been preserving the birth of the American Space Age for over 21 years, and our International Space Station has been occupied for 22 years coming up here in this November. And we love celebrating the Space Age, and my co-producer, Marty Winkle, and I. Hey, Marty, how you doing? Hello, Mark. How are you? We're good. We've got a little potpourri of space news and space history and astronaut birthdays for everybody today. And we've got this beautiful sunrise over pad 39B, where Artemis stood for three times. And thank you, Mark Usiak, for that gorgeous photograph that you've shared with us there. Sets the mood for past history of what we wanted to do in space 60 years ago and what kind of rockets were going to take us there to what's happening today uh, with uh, actually today Marty the uh, I need to go out after stay curious and take a picture of the Falcon heavies out on pad 39a as we speak getting ready for a much delayed Air Force uh, top secret spy satellite uh, so we look forward to seeing that launch off on Halloween morning, Marty. So when I think the next Falcon 9 is going to launch off. So, uh, so we've also got an event here in about a week, week from Saturday, no, November 5th. The American Space Museum is going to have a space memorabilia show. We're going to have about 30 vendors there, free appraisals. So if you're in the area and have space memorabilia, We've got two of the world-renowned experts, Ken Havocott and Chuck Jeffrey, who was mentored by Ken. Uh, Ken's got over 50 years in space memorabilia, Chuck about 30, and uh, uh, Chuck owns Bid Again Auctions. And we're going to auction off 12 items at 4 o'clock. Uh, some items are uh, maybe 80 to to $100, and a couple of them are 500 or more dollars. So... We want to raise $5,000 for our galleries improvements and have this be an annual event twice a year, biannual, where we can raise ten grand to upgrade our museum, uh, our cases. Our cases today are re renovated jewelry cases that we got from a, a, a jewelry store in one of the malls that closed. Uh, we've got some new stuff around here, but uh, you get the picture. We're a very humble nonprofit and always looking for your support and a tax deduction form would be coming your way if you wanted to support us on this event, even without being there. So, Marty, uh, incredibly, we are at episode 680. And I think we both hit that at the same time because, wait a minute, where's my, there's what I was looking for. Marty, can you remember back in the COVID days that this program was born out of the COVID pandemic. We wanted to reach out to schools because we thought the kids would be doing virtual uh, tours, uh, being stayed at home during our pandemic. There's our COVID face mask that some of you still have. And incredibly from March 27th, I think, or March 23rd, uh, 2020, that today is our 680th episode. Uh, I've been uh, on every one of them. <laughs> what can I, no, I haven't. I've been on most of them. Uh, you and I probably missed 10 total each, Marty. But uh, and we thank people that have filled in for us. And um, it's just amazing. And I give all the love and tribute to our executive producer uh, and executive director, Karen Conklin, who has been involved with this museum over 20 years. And one of her dreams is to have a very active STEAM program. And we have that going on today in our building with our STEAM educator, Darren Roberts, doing some fun things with a bunch of homeschool kids. Uh, uh, that, that is uh, science that we hope it makes an impression on them to want to pursue it. So. Thank you all for being with us for all these episodes, 680 episodes achieved over two and a half years. And uh, so we're close to 700. And, uh, you know, no big deal. We're just going to keep carrying on and carrying on. And we've only been able to do this and sustain your interest because of some awesome 
friends along the way. We talk a lot about our photographers. One of our friends along the way made this beautiful vest for me. Jean Wright, happy birthday to you, young lady. She was a sew sister on the shuttle program. We have one of her patches in our shuttle workers gallery, and I'm proud to wear this beautiful vest uh, wherever I go, Jean. She's got me a blue one and a black one. I'm wearing the blue-based one today. And that's So Sister Creations on Facebook. And Jean Wright will fix you up. And happy birthday to you. Enjoy the next solar orbit. You share it with in good company with two astronauts and another special friend of mine. We'll find out here in a minute. But we couldn't have done our, all these shows. A comment there, Marty. Yes. Yeah, Dave Stang is asking, it would be great to broadcast episode one. Any chance to replay it on your next vacation? All right, Dave Stangy waiting for me to go on my next vacation. All right, he's he wants to move down here and take over the show, Marty. Uh, and I'd love for him to. Uh, that's a great suggestion. Actually, I looked at it a, a few months ago and, you know, I was kind of shook, struck by the that I started out with what we're doing today. Consistency of, of celebrating space history like no other video podcast or entity out there as far as I'm concerned. So good suggestion. We'll try to do that for you there. Uh, but as I was winding up there, there's a lot of people I talk about. Another comment as I'm getting wound up. Okay, thank you. Okay, they Stang is asking, will Gene and Ken be back on soon? Uh, don't know about that. That's uh, uh, we'll have to talk to them about that. Uh, and uh, uh, our program is attraction, not promotion. So uh, we will see what what we can do to effort that. Uh, I'd love to have them back on the show. So what I'm building up here is some of our great friends I talk about, like Dave Stangy. We've got uh, Gary Gerald out there getting off his tractor in South Carolina, uh, rushing to see uh, Stay Curious. Uh, so many wonderful friends out there. We talk a lot about our photography friends, Tom and Mark Usiak and Carlton Bailey. Uh, and we talk about these people some too, but uh, wanted to uh, just give a shout out to two of our space artists in particular. Marty, that's not Hitchcock, is it? In front of the Paul Cali uh, power to go. That's a little bit too thin for Alfred. A little bit too what? A little bit too thin. Too thin for Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah, well, that's none other than our good friend Chris Kelly. Uh, and this is Chris's piece of artwork that we have been promoting for him with a photograph of the Artemis on the pad by Mark Usiak. Uh, and uh, we want to promote uh, him because there he's a good friend of our museum and we've done the T-shirts with him. And if you, if you haven't gotten your T-shirt, sorry, we got him on the way here in another week had had uh, had a production snag with all the artemis t-shirts our printer was doing but uh, another artist that we love uh doug forrest uh is a absolutely f unreal pencil artist if you will pencil drawing this is of apollo 14 moonwalker al shepherd our american space hero hitting that spalding golf ball with the six iron there and uh at a great perspective so uh, we share some of this art with you all, but we also wanted to share how to order that art from Chris Kelly and Doug Forrest and thank them for supporting Stay Curious. Uh, Chris has been involved with us uh, heavily this year, since the beginning of the year. Doug has come on board uh, in the last few months, and we really appreciate you guys getting the word out, and we owe it to you to sell a few pieces of your artwork, and there's folks is where you can find these talented space artists all right let's see i've got um everybody's been asking me marty what is that bright star after sunset i see this bright star in the east and uh that is the planet jupiter and there is by jove a photograph taken by george fleener astronomy buddy of mine for about four or five decades uh, this is uh, through a nice uh, semi-professional scope, I'll call it, a 10-inch Celestron, 10-inch mirror on that thing. Gives you some great images. And mm -hmm. photographers today take all kinds of images and then uh, capsulate them together, okay? Uh, layer them together. So this is probably a series of 
couple hundred images that are downloaded like a movie film and there's software for that but there's your red spot the dark areas are kind of troughs in the clouds the bright areas are or higher up areas in the cloud bands of this gigantic planet Jupiter that the Webb telescope showed us a couple of weeks ago for the first time. So fantastically, there's your red spot, the, the hydrogen and nitrogen and helium bands that are cold, 300, almost 300 below zero. And Jupiter's got a ropey ring around it. All right. And then you see some of the small moons there in this, this very uh, special image from the Webb telescope. So get out and see Jupiter. It's a lot of fun to uh, 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 look at it through a telescope. Even if you have a hundred dollar big box telescope, okay, uh, you will see the moons. You'll see the tiny disk and then you'll see the little tiny stars around it in a line. If you see three or two, those other ones are either hidden behind Jupiter or in front of it. Yes, Marty, we have a comment. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. It always seems like the pictures you show, we see the moons lined up. Right. Well, that's because we want to show all four moons. Uh, this is a different picture. I don't have a, a picture of the moons here. Uh, we want to show the four Galilean moons like, like they saw it, but if you don't see one, it's behind or in front of it. And there's an application on your smartphone that you can download to show you what the names they are and how they're moving back and forth. Because literally, Marty, in an hour, you can watch these moons change positions. And if one is behind the planet, you can look on your app and see, is it gonna come out from behind it invisible in a half hour or, or two or three hours? Usually it's not more than a couple hours and a hidden one will reveal itself. So good question, Marty. But get out and look at Jupiter by Jove. It is so bright. Uh, and uh, to, the, to its right, the brightest star you would see looking to the right about 20 degrees, which is, that's uh, about 40 degrees, two hand spans like that up there in the sky, is Saturn. And with a good telescope, you'll see the rings of Saturn. And we talked all about that on Stay Star Curious on Monday. Well, we love talking about space history. And one item of space history that I bet has gone escape, Marty, that you on Stay Curious is learning uh, for today is on October 27th, 1961, the largest known rocket to date, the Saturn I first stage booster was successfully flown over the Atlantic Missile Range. 61 years ago, this cluster of eight engines and almost 1.3 million pounds of thrust at launch uh, was the, 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 the most powerful rocket at the time, 61 years ago. Now, 1.3 million pounds of thrust, I think 1.2 million is what the SpaceX Falcon 9 does, Marty. Somewhere around there, one and a half, 1.2 million pounds of thrust. So the Falcon Heavy will have over 6 million pounds of thrust. Uh, but this Saturn 1A launched today. There are uh, off the NASA website gets you an idea of perspective with the the uh, uh, the the leaders of the company that built it. With I'm pretty sure is Rockwell, right, Marty? I'm not sure. Uh, but this uh, S SA1. Look at this gorgeous liftoff photograph of this at uh, 3:06 uh, uh, Greenwich or 15 Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, this was in the early evening of October 2761 from Launch Complex 34. Okay, the famous Launch Complex 34 where the Apollo 1 astronauts lost their lives and Apollo 7 was launched. Uh, the dummy upper stages were filled with water. It reached an altitude of 85 miles, about 215 miles downrange. And in a post-launch statement, Administrator James Webb in 1961, just made administrator, said, quote, the flight today was a splendid demonstration of the strength of our national space program and an important milestone in the buildup of our national capacity to launch heavy payloads necessary to carry out the program projected by Pre President Kennedy on May 25th, unquote from great administrator, Mr. James Webb. And that speech by President Kennedy on May 25th, of course, was the famous, we are going to go to the moon speech. May 25th was actually, I think, uh, 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 anyway, his, 
what his speech is going to the moon is what uh, Webb was referring to. And of course, Administrator Webb is the namesake of the Webb Telescope. Uh, so beautiful picture. A, a, this was built at the Marshall Space Flight Fabrication and Assembly Building there. That's what's going on there at Marshall. And um, 61 years ago, this was the biggest deal and the biggest thing going. Yes, Marty. Yeah, Robert Law says Chrysler was the main contractor at Saturn 1. All right. Thank you, Robert Law. That sounds familiar there. Uh, and uh, appreciate that. Also on this date, when we launched this rocket, guess who did a nuclear test? That's right, Russia. Two R-12s were, were salvo-fired, at least one with a live nuclear warhead, according to a Russian source uh, that supports the research and effects of nuclear explosions on rocket systems. So... Uh, they sent a rocket 180 miles in the air, and supposedly uh, one of them had an active nuclear warhead, and they exploded it to see what the results were going to be in 1961. Such was the uh, arms race build up there. But, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, we could put a pretty, pretty fat rocket, uh, nuclear warhead on this rocket, Marty, with 1.3 million pounds of thrust in 1961, the most powerful rocket of the time. And, of course, this was the bedrock stage of this great Saturn V rocket. So, well, that leads us to think about Artemis and our picture we've been sharing behind you here of Artemis on the pad. Beautiful sunrise taken about two months ago by Mark Usiak. Thank you, Mark, for supporting Stay Curious. Here is the launch times of Artemis. They are going for November 14th, which is... 12.04 a.m. Monday morning, so it's Sunday night after midnight. It's about uh, over an hour window there, so it could go to like 1.09 or 10, something like that. But Marty, look, he got six days in a row from the 14th to the 19th that we could launch Artemis. Uh, so if the weather is not good, they got those backup days, and the launch moves well it stays the same on the 16th and 17th at 104 a.m that's weird uh 111 on the 18th and 19th so they got a bunch of days to get it off and you know what i'm very optimistic it's going to go this time i think um charlie blackwell thompson and her team and the whole artemis crew of teams have been looking forward to this for uh <laughs> 10 years uh I think they're going to hit their mark on, and stun us with a beautiful launch right after midnight on Sunday night, November 14th. Marty will be there selling T-shirts. I'm going to be there with a telescope or two showing people Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars will be up by then. So it should be a good, fun time, Marty. <clears throat> and, uh, well, on our potpourri of Stay Curious today, we've got two birthdays to share. So, and these are some good guys. Let me put my birthday hat on there. And let's have a great happy birthday. 76 years old to Picks. Where's my Picks? Pictures not coming up. Oh, there. I got fooled. Yeah. <laughs> Let me hit. Okay. Happy birthday. Two. Forward. T.J. Hart is 76. He was a one-and-done shuttle astronaut on STS-41C, a very ambitious mission where they uh, deployed the long-duration exposure facility and then retrieved the alien solar max satellite. Uh, he was born October 27, 1946 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he flew that six-day mission uh, in 1984. Uh, a graduate of Lehigh and Rutgers Universities, okay? And after leaving NASA in the late 1980s, Hart was Director of Engineering and Operations at AT&T and T and T Satellite Network there. And uh, there he is giving a talk, uh, as a lot of our 300 astronauts do, uh, to our communities out there. So also a birthday to this guy that we met, Marty, a couple of weeks ago, twice a pilot and twice a commander. Happy birthday, 69-year-old Mike Baker. Michael Allen Baker was born October 27, 1953 in Memphis, Tennessee. 
but he considers Lamar, California to be his hometown. And that's the case with a lot of astronauts born in one place and then maybe they lived there for a year or so and then the family moved away. And so they, a lot of them have an adopted hometown and his is Lamar, California. He was a pilot on SCS-43 that deployed a satellite in 1991 and 52, the microgravity lab on Columbia. There's Mike a couple of weeks ago with our our good friend Nick Thomas, uh, the astronaut wrangler in the back there, and some visitors at the Kennedy Visitors Complex getting an autograph from Mr. Mike Baker. Marty, we enjoyed uh, his talk. There's Yeah, there's uh, uh, Nick Thomas back there. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you remember anything about what uh, uh, Baker was talking about? He was a commander of two spaceships, STS-68 Endeavor Space Radar Lab, and then he docked with the Beer Space Station in 1997 on Atlantis on the STS-81 and hit 40 days in space. He talked a lot about the Russians and enjoyed that, that mission a lot, uh, didn't he, Marty? Remember much about anything that he talked about? Absolutely nothing, because I did not meet him. I didn't. I missed that um, astronaut experience. Ah, that was me by myself then. All right. and uh, But uh, a good guy. Uh, there he is. Uh, uh, actually asked me about memorabilia. And I told about selling some of his memorabilia. And I told him, sir, that, that blue suit that you have on with that uh, 25 patch on it is worth about $1,000. And he goes, really? I said, well, the patch itself is worth four five hundred. That's Mach 25. And only astronauts have achieved that Mach 25, a very cherished patch to have up there. Uh, Baker was involved with the International Space uh, Station as a manager for international operations. He was a great liaison between Russia and NASA uh, after his uh, four flights and uh, twice a pilot and twice a commander. And happy 69th birthday to you, Mike Baker. And keep my hat on there for a minute. A happy first birthday to my granddaughter, McKinley Ann Marquette there with my daughter, Jessica Marquette, who's 26 years old. God bless them both. I'm, I'm just so blessed like all of you grandparents out there is that now I know there's nothing like it. And I have little McKinley there in the, Marty, that is my baby chair from 1954, 55, somewhere in there, that uh, I have little McKinley in there with my daughter. Oh, that's so old furniture. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, but uh, so, uh, so a little indulgence of me bragging about my two favorite girls in my life there. McKinley and Marquette and my daughter Jessica Marquette. Well, a little bit more space history, Marty, and you know I love the dinosaur program. And uh, on this date in 1961, again, not only did we launch our largest rocket, but Defense Secretary Robert McNamara announced that the progress of, uh, the, of the administration's uh, accelerated defense buildup uh, made uh, made use of, of some additional funds, okay, that they were going to give to the dinosaur program. Congress voted $500 million for additional long-range bombers, $180 million for the B-70. I'm not sure what the B-70 is, Marty. And $85 million for dinosaur. And dinosaur is called X-20 for a, a long time, and it was to be launched on a Titan rocket that we launched Gemini spacecraft on, and there is the dinosaur designed as a one-man space plane. Yes, Marty? I think the B-70, isn't that an experimental bomber? Yeah, I would think it is. I'm not, I don't know what that looks like, if that was what the B-52 became, or B-52 is long before this, yeah, 61. Uh, the, uh, but it's just something good to research there. Who knows about the B-70 out there? Well, I want you to know and realize that the dinosaur program was very important to the Air Force. They were going to have their own space program and a space plane. It was going to be a one-man or single-seater, all right? And doesn't this smack of Star Wars and, and, and the single-seater of those Star Wars uh, 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 jet uh, space planes there? Yeah, Marty. Okay, Mark Usak says the XB-70 Mark... Three bomber from Dayton. 
Okay. All right. Good. Thank you, Mark. It was a, it was a uh, supersonic bomber, and he apparently has seen it in Dayton at the uh, uh, Space Flight Museum there. We've got... Uh, uh, so this reminds me of how in the 1960s, particularly 61, 62, in President Kennedy's pledge to go to the moon, uh, private enterprise was looking at space planes of their own. Some of them, like McDonald, came up with, uh, you know, of course, they did the Mercury and Gemini. But the wing plane was still had a lot of fascination. And uh, a couple of years ago, we had in our auction these oversized uh, overhead projector this is about a, a, a eight inch square uh, transparency of thermal structures that McDonnell Douglas is working on and when we talk about steam education science technology engineering arts and math this is some of the art that is why a should be in steam education of course the a can be astronomy how about aerospace uh, agriculture, astronautics, uh, all kinds of things now with A that fit that in the STEAM program. STEAM or STEM, we want to get the kids educated to the possibilities. And we do that by telling them about the history of some of the ideas. Another piece of artwork. And on this, two space planes. One was going to go to the edge of space with a crew of, I don't know, four people maybe, at least two taking up an orbiter space plane that would have maybe up to five to ten people on board it. And one of those concepts in the 1960s from McDonnell Douglas, again, on one of these overhead projector slides, is uh, the ALSS. Uh, it, that doesn't sound for Apollo Lunar anything. I forget exactly what that stood for. Apologize for that. But it shows you a bunch of astronauts in the capsule and one in the back all right, in the um, crew quarters, if you were, in the back. And here we have a blueprint from the 1960s that we found of, of this. And this was sold in an auction, and I made some copies of these because I thought they were so cool. But there you have the astronauts seated here, and then back here was an area where they could get uh, uh, work and, and have uh, sort of like a lower bay unit like the Apollo command module had but much bigger uh, more like a shuttle mid-deck on these things so love looking at and juxtaposing our space history Marty like this with what's going on today because if you go out and look nine miles away from the Indian River here in Titusville you're going to see on pad 39A you're going to see instead of a SpaceX crew dragon there there's the uh, Falcon Heavy is there, and on and over there, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Falcon Heavy could be on pad 40, and I haven't researched that today. Uh, but going up there in the crane sticking out of my head is the gantry for the SpaceX Starship. And just what does this Starship look like, Marty? This is what it looks like going up at Boca Chica in Texas by the Boca Chica girl. Thank you. I share in this picture of yours. Here is the SpaceX. The bottom part is called the BFF for big friggin rocket. No, no joke. That's what they're calling it. It's the BFF. And on top of that is the starship that is going to land on the moon. Once again, Marty, I saw a presentation by a NASA uh, 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 representative that shows the Gateway Lunar Mod uh, Gateway Lunar sp uh, Yes Lunar uh, uh, Space Station, with on the other side of it is a Apollo Lem on steroids looking vehicle, not this uh, bullet looking. Starship. That's what they're going to land on the moon with, folks. That has the contract, all right? Though it hasn't orbited the Earth yet, they hope to do that early next year, I believe, from Texas. And then they're building this gantry. Uh, it's going to look like this at Kennedy Space Center, all right? Kind of, and this is an artist's rendering of that all slicked out. But this is what's going up right there on the right above my head. Someday we'll be gazing at this being fueled out there, Marty. And I can't wait because that's going to create a lot of noise and a lot of attention when that happens here on our space coast. So all this reminds me of the good old days of the space age out there. This is like a 1970s picture of the rocket garden at Kennedy 
visitor's complex, which uh, has become a home away from home for any space geek out here. Uh, they went up to $150 now for an annual pass. But we were out there the other day, Marty, to see the world premiere of a movie called The Rocketeers. And it just stops me in my tracks to go through the gate there and see the beautiful evening light on the rocket garden there of the left to right is the Saturn, is the, is the redstone rocket of uh, Mercury, the suborbital, the Atlas, Mercury's in front of us. Uh, you got a Thor and a, uh, a Gina rocket on the right, uh, a Delta in the middle there, and of course the Titan uh, rocket, Titan II rocket with the Gemini spacecraft on it. And we went out there to see these two young men and their grandpa on the left there with Hazel Banks. Hi, Hazel, and surprise to you, young lady. Uh, that is uh, uh, Silas uh solid on the left with his hat on backwards but he's a smart kid despite his hat on backwards ha 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 and john luke solid there and their grandpa lee solids over there on the left and they were inspired to do a uh apollo era uh documentary that they call the rocketeers and here's i want to put our homage to our apollo program out there uh just three blocks away from our museum, you've got the statue of President Kennedy delivering his great speech. Neil Armstrong handprints there. Let me make that smaller. You can see Neil there on the left, are his handprints in bronze. And the beautiful Apollo monument behind you there has these panels that Sandy Storm, the artist, did depicting every phase of the Apollo there. And uh, But what we went out there to see was a movie called The Rocketeers. And uh, it is the Solid Brothers, Silas and John Luke, like I showed you, showed you there. They had their premiere last Friday. We were privileged to be invited to it. Uh, Marty, I liked it a lot. It's going to be a four-part episode. And episode one featured uh, the uh, Mercury flights in there. You enjoyed it, didn't you? Oh, yeah, it was very well. I, I really did enjoy it. And uh, there's uh, here's our John Tribe on the right. Kind of uh, uh, these guys aren't the Glee Club that he's he's rehearsing with there. Uh, but that's Charlie Murphy right closest to him. We've had Charlie Murphy on our program as we have Dave Henke, Hank in the uh, jacket there. The two gentlemen, the second and fourth gentlemen, I forget their names, but they were highly featured in this documentary the rocketeers and of course john tribe a great friend of the american space museum there so they're shopping it around to get it on uh find it to hopefully get it in theaters uh as they complete uh, episodes two three and four on that so uh the rocketeers you want to look for that and uh thank you uh the silas brothers for inviting us out there and they certainly i'm gonna go backwards here so we can brag on them that they uh there with hazel uh uh, I think uh, Lee Solid says he has uh, 12 grandchildren, something like that. And these two young men have really taken up with their papa to still tell the story of the uh, Apollo era uh, in a very unique way. Uh, they, by, by featuring their, their papa in this, their grandpa in this, uh, and John Tribe is their best friends, uh, Lee Solid and John Tribe, they live next to each other. And that's sort of the sweet part of it, isn't it, Marty? Was was that they're telling it through the eyes of two grandkids that they had pictures of Christmas and, and uh, holiday outings and, and outings like that in it that I think really bring a human element to our great Apollo era. Yes, Marty? Yeah, they didn't really know who their grandfather was as far as as far as space related. They knew he worked out there, but they didn't know the magnitude of, of who he was and what he did. That's right. And those of you who don't know who Lee Solid is, well, he was called the Rocket Guy. And he was responsible for over 30 engines on the Saturn V rocket. Responsible for them. The buck stopped at his desk on any problems when he worked for Rockwell. And uh, what I can't say enough good things about Mr. Lee Solid, a great supporter of our museum, a good mentor to me. Uh, and, and learning the, the Space Coast here and the kind of the business side of it and, uh, and always giving of his time. And his wife, Shirley, 
uh, been with him since they were teenagers in Nebraska. Uh, so my hat's off to you, Mr. Lee Solid, and so glad that your grandsons here uh, uh, are, are carrying the message there. Well, getting to the bottom of our Stay Curious program here today, literally, the bottom is our new floors here. Uh, and this is some carpet squares. They don't look like carpet squares, but we got this nice pattern going all over our museum. It looks nice. This is, of course, our shuttle gallery. And those those long strips you see on the wall, thank you, Mr. Launch Director Mike Leinbach, for giving us those. Those were on the hatches of the last three shuttles to go to space in the white room. Marty, you got a comment or question there? Yeah, William uh, Whiting wants to know, where can we see the Rocketeers? You can't yet. And we'll let, let you know when you can. Okay. This was a world premiere. They're shopping it around to a distributor. Uh, so uh, to, to see if it can be in either a, uh, well, all these distributors are out there from Peacock to uh, Netflix to, I'm sure they'd love to get it on Netflix or something like that, or in your local theater. But so thank you for that good question there, William Whiting. So I can't see it yet. Can't see it yet. Uh, and we thank watching today Melissa Pope and her friends at the Space Coast Office of Tourism, hopefully crowded around, staying a little curious today, your uh, computer. Keith Sewell. Keith, I was just thinking of you today driving in that I hadn't seen you at our astronomy club meetings, but uh, hope to see you uh, around a telescope soon here, Keith Sewell. Uh, Carlton Bailey, thank you, Carlton. Madeline Vanderlaan, Pam Shivik. Pam is a uh, she loves astronomy like me and is also a Buckeye with her husband uh, <clears throat> from Lorraine, Ohio, is where Pam Shivik is from. Uh, Robert Law, thank you for watching in uh, uh, Dundee, Scotland. Uh, Christopher Mix in Wisconsin. Doug Forrest, glad to give you a shout out today, Doug, of your fine art. Okay, and. Uh, uh, one other great picture to show you today. Thinking of our good buddy Carlton Bailey. He shot this. You know, I'm a flag waver. I love our country. I love promoting the greatest space program ever on the face of the earth is here in America. Uh, yep, 17 countries are helping us out on that space station, but it wouldn't have got up there without our wonderful shuttle up there. So, uh, so going out with the flag and just another happy birthday to my granddaughter, one-year-old McKinley Marquette there with my daughter, Jessica. So God bless you all. And, and, uh, and I mean it out there when I say God bless America and what our great space age has done for us uh, over six decades of changing our world completely. So Marty, that's our Stay Curious 600 episode 680 today. Hope you've all enjoyed it. We'll be back again, Marty and I, and we hope that you're back again with me, Mark Marquette, on Stay Curious, where we do what? We bridge the space between us. Thank you very much.